Um, today's video is going to go over uh, both the Apology and the Crato. Um, both are your assigned readings. Uh, I've supplemented these videos by um, adding a couple of additional videos to, uh, to Moodle as well. You're responsible for these in addition. Um, you'll see in this video I'll make some reference to, uh, for example, what Roderick says um, about uh, the nature of democracy and Socrates' arguments as we go through as well. Um, uh, it's not my attempt to um, exhaustively treat either the Apology or the Credo. Uh, this is the first of the two videos in the playlist being the Apology. Um, uh, it, it, so in no way is, um, is this video content to um, sort of substitute for your actually reading uh, the, 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 the text at hand. Uh, these are fairly approachable, accessible texts. Uh, the Apology is effectively Socrates' trial defense. Um, against the charges um, that were brought, well, against two sets of charges by two different sets of accusers, he starts off by telling us. Um, uh, so this is effectively his trial defense, and I hate to give away spoilers, but um, nonetheless, his trial defense was, as we'll see, um, not successful in what we get. Um, in the Crito is the title character, Crito. Uh, approaching Socrates in prison uh, pretty well on the eve of his execution for the charges that, um, that he's found guilty of in this trial, uh, Crito approaches Socrates with a plan to escape and an argument for why he should escape. As we get to know Socrates, we'll see exactly why Socrates requires an argument um, in order to impel him to action as well. So that will be video two for the uh, the Crato. Now, um, I wanted to start out uh, the other video content I gave you on pre-Socratic philosophy leading up to Socrates. Um, it basically led up to, or it brought you right up to the point where um, Socrates is um, hanging around and arguing in Athens. Uh, recall Par uh, Parmenides and Heraclitus had their debate. It wasn't a literal debate or nonetheless, but there was a contradiction between their theories, um, which both seemed to be sound arguments, but both um, both argued to mutually exclusive conclusions. They directly contradicted one another. And this brought about a period of skepticism. Um, as Roderick will mention too, uh, you know, it's also the democracy in Athens was rather unsure of itself, just finding its footing again after um, a period of authoritarian rule uh, by 30 tyrants, which Socrates will um, make, um, make, make reference to here. Um, in the previous video, I mentioned Protagoras and Protagorean uh, relativism and is the measure of all things and of things that are that they are and of things that are not that they are not kind of thing. Um, but nonetheless, um, Protagoras was one of the 30 tyrants who ruled over Athens in that period, ruled over Greece in that period, really. Um, so uh, just a couple of words quickly about the kind of trial that this is. Um, first off, uh, these were huge trials um, it, it, involving, in this case, uh, in the preamble, it tells you uh, there were 501 judges, like the, the, the jury was 501 people, basically whoever showed up to court that day. And um, basically how this would go is the charges would be brought against Socrates. Socrates would have a chance to respond to those charges, very time limited. Socrates will chafe against that a little bit. And um, then everybody votes. And if the person is found guilty, as is in the case here, um, then uh, the accusers suggest some sort of penalty as some sort of sanction, in this case, death. Right? They want Socrates executed. And then the, the sort of most amusing section of uh, this particular dialogue, um, the accused is then given um, the opportunity to suggest a counter penalty. Right? And then everybody votes about, well, do we go with the accusers or the accused? Right? 
and then there is a chance for closing words from the accused or the, the, the last kick at the can. So um, that will be the general structure of um, of this particular of this particular dialogue. Um, we do not get uh, a, a, a section where um, uh, Miletus and Antiphon and all of those guys are bringing their charges against Socrates, right? but um, it, nonetheless we get Socrates' response, some cross-examination with regard to the particular charges that they've brought against him, um, and uh, that, that's as much as we get from the accusers here. So the focus is Socrates, who starts off um, by pointing out that uh, largely in the, the in, in what was laid against Socrates in the way of an accusation, the the, the jury was warned um, against Socrates' persuasive and flowery manner of speaking. Right, so effectively. That they warned the jury that Socrates uses persuasive rhetoric in order to sway people's opinions. And Socrates points out that, well, first off, um, this must be the most embarrassing thing, just because the second Socrates starts, he's going to be contradicted because he's not accustomed to um, to, to to speaking in the manner of a trial, right? Um, it's, it, in fact, this is the first time he's been before the courts at the age of 70, and um, really the, he's going to speak in the manner that he would in front of the bankers' tables in the Agora, basically the mall, right? So it's, he's, he's got sort of a street slang rather than um, the, the, the formal sort of trial language that people are accustomed to. Um, and he lays out an, in, in an interesting um, a, a, a statement right at the beginning on your page 23. Um, just if I were really a stranger, you would certainly excuse me if I spoke in that dialect and manner in which I had been brought up. So to my present request seems a just one. For you're to pay no attention to my manner of speech, but be it better or worse, but to concentrate your attention on whether what I say is just or not, for the excellence of a judge lies in this, as that of a speaker lies in telling the truth. So right off the bat, what Socrates wants to do is lay out a hard distinction between um, reason, right, which leads to that which is most just, right, and the emotions, right? So what Socrates wants the jury to do is be persuaded by reasons with regard to the justice right, of the matter. And Socrates sees his job as just telling the truth. Right? Just, I'm going to tell the truth and you can judge the justice of this. Later on in this dialogue, um, Socrates points out, um, and this is way on, um, in the dialogue here, I am in the credo here, um, but um, he points out that, you know, frankly, the same logic pertains to this trial as in our trials today. Uh, the thing is that in our trials, I mean, if you've got a lawyer and you're facing charges and that sort of thing, the lawyer is going to tell you to put on a clean suit, to have your family all dressed up and sitting there in the front row and weeping and playing on the emotions of the jury. Um, Socrates had a wife, uh, Xanthepi, who was um, apparently Roderick mentioned. She's a, a, a rather notable for being a shrew, um, and uh, he had two sons as well, all right? Um, and he points out, and this is way on page 39, I just want to illustrate this point here. Um, do, 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 uh, uh, yeah, middle of the page, right by C. I do not think it's right to supplicate the jury and to be acquitted because of this, but to teach and persuade them. It's not the pur purpose of a juryman's um, office to give justice as a favor uh, to whoever seems good to him, but to judge according to the law and this he is born to do. We should not accustom you to perjure yourselves, nor should we make a habit of it. It's uh, irreverent conduct for either of us. So throughout the argument, what Socrates is going to be doing is 
hitting the point that we should not be persuaded by our emotions, but rather be persuaded by reason. Now, this is one of the hallmarks of philosophy. Right? Reasons should be the persuasive element. We shouldn't emote our way through. And this, as you'll see, um, I, I tend to think of the apology as a dialogue that lays out the necessary con conditions for, for, for function in democracy. Right? Socrates' case is that one of the problems with Athenian democracy and one of the problems with the way the Athenian courts work is that they are persuaded by rhetoric and emotional diatribe. Right? So rather than thinking about evidence and trying to choose what is most just or best, what people do is they emote. They opine, right? They pull the democratic lever on the basis of what feels good to them rather than what is rationally revealed as what is best. Now, as Roderick points out in his Socrates video, a democracy is one of those play, uh, one of those political scenarios where, you know, we are both ruled and rule, right? And in the context of a democracy, in the context of a civil society, as Roderick lays it out, right? The presupposition, right? The nature of the freedom in terms of a de democracy, the political freedom there, is that we should accept no force save for the peculiarly sort of unforced force of the better argument. So if I want to alter your behavior or change your opinion or get you to do something, the only way I am justified in doing so is by presenting a set of reasons and persuading you that my reasons justify the conclusion that you should act in this way, right? So basically in that context, right? If I present you an argument, you go, oh, geez, well, I never thought of it that way. And then you alter your behavior. That's, that's the way a democracy works, right? Versus other forms of political regime where, you know, the actual physical force of legal penalties, of physical harm of, um, you know, it's various kind of sanctions, that sort of thing, wind up being a persuasive. The unique thing about a democracy is that in the context of a democracy, the only force you should, um, you should, should accept is the force of the better argument. Right? So this shows that in the context of a democracy, in the context of a court scenario, in the context of um, the kind of civil society that Socrates is trying to lay out here and which um, was picked up in terms of the founding documents for both Canada and the United States and just about every other modern democracy, is this idea that we should be persuaded by reasons. This is part of the reason we are asked to vote in the first place because we might have an understanding of the situation which is productive. We do not need to be ruled by a tyrant or a dictator or an oligarch or a paternal figure or a sovereign. We don't need to. We can rule ourselves because each of us within our own human capacities has this faculty of reason, right, which is common and shared between us. We can figure it out ourselves. So a democracy is one of those places where we're all called upon to be experts, right? or at least assess expertise in order to come to the conclusion that's best for the society. Right? So that's, that's, that's the fundamental sort of presupposition at the root of um, Socrates' uh, argument here. Right? And interestingly, and I'll, I'll come back to this later, but interestingly, 
The weird thing about Socrates' argument in favor of democracy, he tends to think this, this Socrates that we're getting here, his student Plato didn't agree, right? but nonetheless, this Socrates here tended to think that a democracy was potentially at least the best possible political arrangement. Why? Not because a democracy is democracy and it's a good in itself or anything along those lines, but rather because a democracy is based, presupposes, and depends upon the expression of the most noble of our human capacities, our ability to get into a rational dialogue and a, a debate with one another in order to express that which is most truly human and truly great about us, right? So it's because a democracy demands that we use our own reason right, to follow arguments, to make arguments, to persuade by argument, rather than an appeal to brute force, right, that this is a good political scenario. Maybe there are other, and I don't, I don't have one kind of thing. Maybe there are other political arrangements that do this as well. But a democracy is the one that we know about that does this. So a democracy is good because it allows that which is most fully human and fully noble in us to be expressed. Now, Socrates' first, first gambit here, right, lays out a distinction between his first accusers and his later accusers. And Socrates is not as worried about his later accusers. You'll see when the, we get to the actual charges that are brought against Socrates, he's not going to spend that much time against it. Right? He spends the bulk of his time arguing about these first accusers, those who have accused him long ago those who he can't even call in front of the, um, the, the, the court in order to, um, to cross-examine. Effectively, he's got a box with shadows with regard to these guys. Right? Um, these accusers are basically the weight of public opinion. Remember, he's 70, and he's been arguing in the Agora for a long time. Right? So Socrates has gotten himself... A reputation, right? A reputation for being sort of a crazy old coot, right? Um, he points out, um, it, 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 I want you to realize that um, two, my accusers are of two kinds: those who have accused me recently and the old ones I mentioned. And uh, to think I must first defend my uh, myself against the latter. For you've also heard their accusations first and to a much greater extent than the more recent. And he points out um, that, that effectively these accusers, well, there was a play about Socrates, right? Um, wherein Socrates was, um, you know, it, it shown to be a bumbling fool, a philosopher, contemplating things in the heaven and under the earth and trying to make the weaker appear the stronger, right? He lays out the charges of these first accusers on your page 24. It goes something like this. Socrates is guilty of wrongdoing, that he busies himself studying things in the sky and below the earth, and he makes the worse into the stronger argument and teaches these th same things to others. You've seen this yourself in the comedy of Aristophanes, a Socrates swinging about there, uh, saying he's walking on air and talking about uh, a lot of other nonsense about uh, about uh, things of which I know nothing at all. I do not speak in contempt, contempt of such knowledge. If someone is wise in these things, lest Miletus bring more cases against me, but gen gentlemen, I have no part in it, and on this point, I call upon the majority of you as witnesses. I think it right that all of them, those of you who have heard me conversing, and many of you, uh, many of you have, should tell each other if any one of you has ever heard me discussing about such subjects, to any extent at all. From this, you will learn that <clears throat> the other things said about me by the majority are of the same kind. Both.
basically, right? Um, then, as Roderick points out, the really persuasive argument, you see, this charge against Socrates basically accuses him of being a sophist, right? basically teaching persuasive rhetoric, hawking his wares to, um, to, to enrich himself by teaching people to uh, make persuasive and undermining kind of arguments. Right? So his really persuasive, as Roderick points out, uh, argument for how he's not a, a sophist, first he claims that he doesn't really teach any, any, anybody anything because he doesn't know anything. Right? And secondly, he's quite poor. He's not paid for this, right? So effectively, right, that's face value why he's a sophist. Of course, the question arises, right? Why do people think this of you? How did you gain this reputation, right? How did you gain such a reputation for this kind of sophistry if, in fact, you are not? Where does this come from, Socrates? Well, so starts the story. Socrates had a buddy, right? and his buddy decided to go to the Oracle at Delphi. The Oracle at Delphi is sort of a Pythian woman, right? Um, I don't know if you've seen 300. That's basically the Pythian in 300 is a good sort of example of, of what it, it, dramatization of what Socrates it did. So basically, you would go to the Pythian, right? You'd give some sort of a sacrifice, gold coin, something, that sort of thing, and you would ask the Pythian a question. In this case, Socrates' buddy asked the Pythian, who is the wisest man in Athens? Now, effectively, this oracle, who was thought to be a direct conduit from the gods, so you could trust whatever the Pythian oracle says, right? always speaks the truth, the God's honest truth, right? So this is straight from the gods. Well, effectively what she would do is get very, very high, chop the head out of a chicken, splay its entrails, read the entrails, start speaking in tongues, ah, and then give you an answer. In this case, the answer was Socrates is the wisest man in Athens. So Socrates' buddy, who's gone now, but who's, <coughs> <coughs> excuse me, I've got a thing, um, whose buddy, um, his brother is still around and will vouch for this. He comes running back down from the article, Socrates, Socrates, guess what? Guess what? You're the wisest man in Athens. You're the wisest man in Athens. Now, this confused Socrates quite a bit because, as he points out, he doesn't know a darn thing. This is your page 26. So, um, top of the page, um, he went to Delphi at one time, ventured uh, to ask the oracle, and I say, gentlemen, do not create a disturbance. He asked if any man was wiser than I, and the Pythian replied that no one was wiser. Chirophon is dead, but his brother will testify um, to you about this. Consider that I tell you this because I would inform you about the origin of the slander. I heard of this reply and asked myself, whatever does this mean? What is this riddle? I'm very conscious that I'm not wise at all. What then does he mean by, by saying that I am the wisest? For surely it does not, uh, he does not lie, for it's not legitimate for him, the God, to do so. For a long time, I was uh, at a loss as to this meaning, and then very reluctantly turned to some such investigation as this. I went to one of those reputed to be wise, thinking that there, if anywhere, I could refute the oracle and say to it, this man is wiser than I, but you said I was. Then, when I examined this man, and there's no need for me to tell you his name, he was one of our public men, my experience was something like this. I thought that he appeared wise to many people, and especially himself, but he was not. I then tried to show him that he thought himself wise, but that he was not, and as a result he came to dislike me, and so did many of the bystanders. So I withdrew and thought to myself, I am wiser than this man. 
it's likely that neither of us knows anything worthwhile, but he thinks him, he knows something when he does not, whereas I do not know, neither do I think I know. So I'm likely to be wiser than he to this small extent, that I do not think I know when I do not know. After this, I approached another man, uh, one, th uh, one th of those thought to be wiser than he. And I thought the same thing, so I came to be disliked by <clears throat> both by him and by many others. After that, I proceeded systematically. Now, just a quick word about what Socrates is doing here, right? Uh, what, what he noticed is that many people held beliefs. but that those beliefs were not supported by reasons. Another way of saying this is that really, when called to account for your be beliefs, right? if those beliefs are going to count as knowledge, you have to be able to offer an account. You've got to not only state the belief, but why the belief is true. Right? So effectively, right, people opined, but were not able to support those opinions rationally. Right? So effectively, right, what Socrates is doing is, well, going around town, pointing out other people's bullshit. Right? So uh, after this, he proceeded systematically. Uh, there were a fair number of people in Athens. He can't just talk to everyone, though he tried. Right? And um, he went through the various classes. Right? Um, do, 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 do. Uh, first, he approached all of the public men. Right, kind of thing, right? All of the the politicians, the orators, that sort of thing, the the, the 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 religious authorities, and that sort of thing. And what he found was that um, in my investigation in the service of the god, I found that those of the highest reputation were nearly the most deficient, while those who were thought to be inferior were more knowledgeable. I must give you an account of my my journeyings, as if they. Uh, were labors uh, I had undertaken to prove the oracle irrefutable. After the politicians, I went to the poets, the writers of tragedies, the diatrabs, and others intending, in their case, to catch myself being more ignorant than they. This is 26 to 27, if you're looking for it. Now, something interesting happened when he went to uh, the poets and the orators and that sort of thing. These are the glitterati, right? These are the people that come up with the beautiful stories that entertain people and that sort of thing. Um, here's a good example. If you've ever seen the movie Fight Club and actually gone through the actor commentary on it, Edward Norton's actually not bad, but just to hear Brad Pitt try and talk about what he was acting in that movie I'm so glad that he just had a script and read it, because really, if he were doing what he claimed to be doing, what a horrible movie that was, it would be, right? But really, it was, it, it was a wonderful film, right? So, effectively, right, what Socrates found is that when he went to the artist class and asked the artists how they write their books, right their poetry that sort of thing just about anybody from the audience could offer a better explanation so socrates concludes that really perhaps the things of beauty that they create which are irrefutably beautiful and challenging and bring out interesting sort of reflections and insights and and, and catharsis in people right you know, the, the, product, the, the, the products of their labors are irrefutably beautiful, right? But the interesting thing is they couldn't offer any sort of account 
right? not a satisfactory account of how these things were created. So Socrates concluded that perhaps it's some sort of inspiration from the muses that helps them produce this thing. So really, these people are kind of like the Pythian, a conduit from the gods to create beauty. So, no wisdom to be had there, though they commit the cardinal sin, the same one that the generals committed, that the politicians committed, that the religious authorities committed. They thought they were wise when they were not. Right? The religious leaders couldn't explain what virtue and piety was. Generals couldn't tell you why they fought the battles the way they fought the battles. Um, you know, poets couldn't explain where their poetry comes from. Musicians couldn't explain where it's, it's inspiration. It's the divine muses, right? So effectively, all of these people thought they could explain, but they couldn't explain. They thought they were wise when, in fact, they were not. And then finally, Socrates went to the craftsman, sorry, middle of 20, uh, 27, um, for I was conscious of, uh, 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 conscious of knowing practically nothing, and I knew that I would find that they had knowledge of many fine things, like how to work with leather, how to shoe horses, how to cut stone, etc., etc. And in this I was not mistaken. They knew things I did not know. And to, the, uh, to that extent, they were wiser than I. But men of Athens, the good craftsmen seemed to me to have the same fault as the poets. For each of them, because of his success at his craft, thought himself very wise in other most important pursuits. And this error of theirs overshadowed the wisdom that they had, so that I asked myself, on behalf of the oracle, whether I should pr prefer to be as I am, with neither their wisdom nor their ignorance, or to have both. The answer I gave myself and the oracle was that it was to be my, uh, to my advantage to be as I am. Right. So, 1 minus 1, 0, versus Socrates, a natural 0. Right. Well, effectively, Right. Well, what Socrates was finding in these craftsmen is this detractor of the minus one. They thought they were wise when they weren't. Taking apart, aside, you know, knowledge of things like shoeing horses and working with leather, etc., etc. Right. This detractor, right, is such a detractor as to discount their knowledge. So Socrates. Neither does he think he knows, nor does he know. Right? He's not deceived with regard to his own knowledge. Is preferable. Right? So, there is an interesting position that comes out. Recall, right? in the wake of Heraclitus and Parmenides, right? the, the conclusion that the Athenians came to was that, well, maybe human wisdom cannot lead us to the truth. The sophist took that as justification. Hey, maybe it's okay then to use persuasive rhetoric to essentially get our way, to make money, to gain power, etc. etc. Right? Socrates has come to the same conclusion. Right? As a result of my investigation, men of Athens, I acquired much unpopularity of a kind that's hard to deal with and is a heavy burden. Many slanders came from these people, and my reputation for wisdom, um, uh, for in each case the bystanders thought I myself possessed the wisdom that I proved my interlocutor did not have. What is probable, gentlemen, is in fact the god is wise and his auricular response meant that human wisdom is worth little or nothing, and that when he says, this man, Socrates, he's using my name as an example, as if he said, this man among you mortals is wise as who, like Socrates, understands that his wisdom is worthless. So even now I continue this investigation as the god bade me. And I go around seeking anyone, citizen or stranger, whom I think, uh, whom I think wise, and if I do not think he is, I come to the assistance of the god, 
and show him that he's not wise. Because of this occupation, I do not have the leisure to engage in public affairs to any extent, nor indeed to look after my own. But I live in great poverty because of my service to the god. So, there's something interesting that goes on here, and that's a transition from epistemology to ethics. Uh, recall, it, it, I was just saying about the sophists, I took a brief pause there, sorry about that, um, uh, is uh, that, you know, really, since we know nothing, then the game becomes tricking one another into thinking, believing, and acting as I would like you to. Right? This is why it was such a big deal to get a sophist uh, to teach your son, right? and it's specifically son in the context of Athens, um, to, 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 to argue persuasively because how you would make money, how you would gain power is showing up to the courts and making arguments. And this effectively undermines the systems of justice that are in place in a democracy. Persuasive argumentation, um, in our context today, lobbyists, that sort of thing, really undermine these institutions that through the best argument are supposed to produce that which is most just or best in a society. This was a major problem in Athens. Socrates oddly agrees we can know nothing. That's his epistemology. That's his theory of knowledge. Right? What's probable, gentlemen, is that the god is wise and that his auricular response meant that this, that human wisdom is worth little or nothing. Right? It's, it, human wisdom is worthless. Right? Now, it's interesting that Socrates applies that to everyone. Right? There's no one of us that can completely justify our beliefs with reason. So there's no one of us that is justified in dogmatically, uh, belligerently holding their beliefs and, you know, being belligerent to the reasons of others. Right? So the key here becomes dialogue. Right? So how does this work out in terms of an ethics? Because this is really one of the brilliant things that Socrates does. I'm amazed every time I read through it and just go, oh, I get it. Right? Every time. I've been teaching this material for a long time. This is a really clever move. If I know nothing and you know nothing and we all have these beliefs that are justified somewhat by reasons, I'm not justified in holding that belief without giving you an account of that belief, right? You should act in such a way. This is the way human beings have to act, etc., etc. There's no one of us that is justified in holding that belief without offering an explanation for why. And that explanation must be satisfactory. Right? We must also be open to reasons that contradict our beliefs. Right? So, how does this work out? If I make a claim to knowledge, I know that marriage is between a man and a woman, etc., etc., I'd better be able to give reasons for that, and those reasons have to be themselves a matter of debate, right? So, if I make a claim to knowledge, right, I have to introspectively evaluate my own claim to knowledge, right? I have a belief here, but really, how sound is that belief? And if I hear other people making claims to knowledge, I am in a position where I am obligated to demand reasons in the way of justification for that belief, for that claim to knowledge, if it's going to count as a claim to knowledge. What Socrates noticed is that most people in Athens had opinions and beliefs that they voted on the basis of, that they refused to justify, that they were unable to justify, right? and they were belligerent to the reasons that would count as justification, and they were belligerent to reasons that were counter to their beliefs. Right? So effectively, this was undermining the courts and undermining the democratic institutions of the Athens of the day, right? So, 
Effectively, Socrates starts out with nothing in terms of an epistemology and formulates a positive ethics. Here's one more example. Let's do a specifically Athenian example. Right? In the context of Athens, women were not allowed to vote or own property or that sort of thing. Right? And the justification for this is that women are not fully rational and therefore not fully human. Okay, show me your reasons. Let's have a debate about this. Let's have a discussion about this. And what you'll find ultimately is that that is an unjustifiable position that for millennia dominated Western culture, to some extent even today. Right? To a much less extent than Athens, right? But nonetheless, it's, I mean, we can, we can be on a high horse about this, but it's only in the past couple of hundred years that significant gains have been made in that respect, right? So effectively, right, what Socrates has done is stressed moral reasoning, right? You have moral beliefs that then have to be justified by reasons which must be publicly debated right, for your position. Right? So this is, this is a cornerstone of Socrates' position. The goal being that you should avoid that cardinal Socratic sin of thinking you're wise when in fact you're not. Right? Because as he found, most people had the beliefs but were belligerent to the reasons that were supposed to support those beliefs. So that, I think, is one of the most important and interesting um, aspects of Socrates. He then turns, um, and, and also uh, at the same time, it's his explanation of why people are so irked with him, why so many have such a poor opinion of him, because when you isolate people, and it, Socrates is doing this in the most populated area, by the bankers' tables in the Agora, which was basically the, the nicest mall in the world. Athens was a port town. They had a huge merchant navy. And if it was available in the world, it would be available in the mall and effectively the Agora, right? So it's this is... He was doing this in public. He would approach a public figure, right, question them, and demonstrate very publicly that they were not wise when, in fact, they thought they were wise, that they could not support their beliefs by reasons. Right? So effectively, people got irked. You know that book? Um, it's It was all the rage when I was younger, How to Win Friends and Influence People. This is kind of like the inverse, right? Socrates proceeds systematically to annoy and alienate people, right? So, um, yeah. Now, Socrates then turns to the specific charges, first of corrupting the youth and then not believing the gods of the state. And I'm not going to spend a long time on um, these charges because Socrates doesn't. Um, so effectively, right, um, there are these two sets of charges which uh, Miletus and his cronies have, have brought against Socrates. Right. Uh, the first um, involves two lines of argument, um, and uh, they, they show something um, about Socrates' position and about ancient philosophy specifically that will linger on a little bit in this class. So um, effectively, um, it, it, it starts on your page 28. Um, it, it, he addresses the charge, Socrates is guilty of corrupting the young and not believing in the gods of the city. Uh, in whom the in gods in whom the city believes, but other new spiritual things, such as their charge. Let's examine it point by point. He says, I'm guilty of corrupting the young, but I say that Miletus is guilty in dealing frivolous with serious, uh, frivolously with serious matters of irresponsibly bringing people into court and professing to be seriously concerned with things about none of which he has ever cared. And I shall try to prove it so. All right. So effectively, Socrates wants to cross-examine Miletus here. Basically, right, um, Socrates says, okay, you 
You claim that I corrupt the youth. You must have given this some thought. Otherwise, you're dealing frivolously with serious matters and irresponsibly bringing people into court, right? So, effectively, right, tell these men who improves the youth. Obviously, you know. In, sorry, I'm quoting from uh, 29. Obviously, no, in, your, in, view, um, in view of your concern. You say you've discovered the one who corrupts them, namely me, and you bring me here and accuse me to these men. Come, inform these men and tell them who it is who improves them. You see, Miletus, that you're silent and you do not know, um, uh, you know not what to say. Does this not seem shameful to you and sufficient proof of what I say that you have not been concerned with any of this? Tell me, good sir, who improves the young men? Miletus responds, the laws. Well, that's an interesting response, the laws improve. But the laws are not a person, right? What person? improves the youth, because Socrates is apparently the person who corrupts them. Show me the person or people who improve the youth. So, Miletus responds, these jurymen, Socrates. Mm -hmm. How do you mean, Miletus? Are these able to educate the young and improve them? Certainly. All of them, or some, but not others. All of them. Uh, this is this is good rhetoric, right? It's you flatter the jury, kind of thing. But like, who else? What about the audience? Yeah, them too. How about the members of councilor? Yeah, the councilors also. All right. But Miletus, what about the assembly? Do the members of the assembly corrupt the young, or do they improve them? They improve them. All of Athens, it seems, make the young into fine and good men, except me, I alone corrupt them. That is what you mean? That is most definitely what I mean. So Socrates is the sole bloody corrupter of the youth in the whole of Athens. The rest of the city improves the youth. This seems a little fishy to Socrates. And this is where we meet Socrates. It's what I call his down-home wisdom. Everything's a little bit like raising horses. All right. Now, think about this. Is this also the case with horses, right? That everybody who hops on the back of a horse improves the horse, save for one person who is its sole corrupter? Or is it more likely the case that there are experts who improve the horse, namely horse breeders and trainers, and just about everybody else who jumps on the back of a horse corrupts the horse, right? Well, that seems to be the case, right? So, Miletus' argument does not seem to hold water. Second line of argument, right? Second line of argument, and this is an interesting one here. Now, you accuse me here, this is page 30, of corrupting the young and making them worse deliberately or un unwillingly. Miletus says, Deliberately. So Socrates is the mustache twisting villain, right, with the damsel dot. And so, so Socrates intentionally corrupts the youth. Immediately, this doesn't make sense to Socrates. Right? It, there are two ways to think of this argument. There's the straightforward way to think of this argument. It's like, let's say, you know, if I surround myself with corrupt people, am I more likely to be harmed by those corrupt people than by non-corrupt people? Yes, it would seem. So if I intentionally corrupt those around me, I am effectively being so stupid as to do myself harm. That doesn't make any sense. Right? That doesn't make any sense. But here's another way right, to think about this argument. And it introduces something about Socratic philosophy. There are presuppositions that stand behind Socrates' philosophy. One we've seen right off the bat, knowledge is virtue. Right? Knowledge is virtue. Right? You know, knowledge is a good thing no matter what. Right? 
The second premise is those that know the good do the good. And then finally, that evil arises as an involuntary error due to ignorance. All right. So effectively, knowledge good, ignorance bad. All right. So our task consists in sort of justifying our beliefs to get as close to knowledge as possible. There's something appealing about this kind of position. Nah. Something appealing about this. You ever think, with regard to people who act like jerks to you, that, you know, there must be something they're failing to understand. Why are they like that? Why are they doing that? If there was something that we could just work out, work an understanding out, then everything would be okay. Right? There's something appealing about this position. Right? This is a position that is central to Socratic philosophy, that basically the only reason people do hurtful, jerky, nasty, corrupting kind of things is because they don't know any better. They haven't thought it through properly. Right? And if you had knowledge of the good, then you'd pretty well immediately do that. We'll think about this a little bit. Right? Uh, throughout this course. This is going to be like one of the themes, right? It, because to a certain extent, when we turn to other philosophy, Plato and Aristotle, right, for example, it, they're still thinking about this problem, right? It, between it, knowledge is virtue, those that know the good do the good, and the evil arises as an involuntary error due to ignorance. Is it possible, ask these later philosophers, Right, for you to know the good and just bloody well not do it. Well, what accounts for that in terms of moral psychology? Right? This is a rather straightforward kind of position in moral psychology. You know the good, you do it. Right? If you understand what's best, you do what's best. Right? It would seem. Right? The only reason you don't do, do what's best is because you didn't know it was going to be best. Right? If I knew what the best menu item was, right, I would order that. Right? The only reason I don't is because I don't know the menu well enough, etc., etc. Right? If I know what the best car salesperson is, I would get that car salesperson. Right? The only reason I wind up with a jerk is because I don't know any better, right? etc., etc., etc. Right? <coughs> so, I mean, effectively, right, what Socrates is saying is that nobody would corrupt the youth deliberately. It must be unwillingly or accidentally, right? And he continues here, right? Now, if I corrupt, uh, corrupt them unwillingly, the youth unwillingly, the law does not require you to bring people into court or such unwilling wrongdoings, but to get a hold of them properly, to instruct them and exhort them. For clearly, if I learn better, I shall cease to do what I'm doing unwillingly. You, however, have avoided my company and were unwilling to instruct me, but you bring me here where the law requires one to bring those who are in need of punishment, not of instruction. And so, men of Athens, what I said is clearly true. Miletus has never been concerned with these matters. Nonetheless, tell us, Miletus, how you say that I corrupt the young, um, or is it obvious from your disposition that it is by teaching them not to believe in the gods whom the city believes, but in other new spiritual things? Mm. Is this not what you say I teach and so corrupt them? Mm. This is most certainly what I say, responds Miletus. Right. So effectively, it turns out that, you know, this corrupting the youth charge, one, is not all that important. Two, right, this corrupting the youth charge is not well substantiated. Right? He hasn't gone through much thought in terms of what it means to corrupt the youth. Right? And secondly, right, in fact, if he corrupts the youth, the court isn't even the right venue for it, given that he needs instruction, not punishment. Right? 
Now, effectively, it turns out that, it, you know, it's not believing in the god, gods whom the city believes. That turns out to be the central charge against Socrates. All right? Because this corrupting the youth charge is clearly just tripe. Right? It's, it's nothing serious. All right? Now, Socrates in the next, um, next line of argument, where he turns to addressing not believing in the gods, Right, which I've shortened here, right, whom the city believes, because Socrates questions Miletus, and Miletus actually winds up arguing that Socrates is an atheist. Socrates is an atheist. Well, the trick that Socrates uses to refute this charge is something that we call logical entailment. Well, Here's, here's just, just we'll go through the argument really quickly. Would you believe in human things, but not humans? No. No. It's because if you believe in human things, that implies, it entails logically, that you believe in humans. How about horsely things? Saddles, horseshoes, horsemanship, but not horses? No. Of course not. Well, how about godly things and not gods. Well, what Socrates points out, right, and um, it, it, this is this is sort of an interesting thing, um, because in in apparently in the um, in the the the, 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 the the sort of charges, right, they made fun of Socrates for having this well-reported little voice in the back of his head. It's the Socratic daemon, right? This Socratic daemon is just a little voice in the back of Socrates' head that tells Socrates not to argue that which is not true or justifiable or consistent. Right? It just chirps up in the back of his head saying, Socrates, no, don't argue that, that sort of thing. And he takes it to be a daemon or a divine spirit, which are thought to be cousins to the gods. Right? So, think of it this way. Would you believe in the god's cousin and not the god? No. So if he believes in the god's cousin, which Miletus has already argued Socrates does, then logically Socrates must believe in the gods. So, bad argument. So it seems fairly clear, right, that Socrates is not guilty of these charges, right? Now, one last big thing that I want to point out to you about this argument, right? like I say, I'm not giving you the, the, the complete treatment of the argument here, but nonetheless, right, there are interesting twists within this argument that I'd like to highlight. And the last one is um, something we call the gadfly argument, right? Um, you find it on page 35, right? Um, and I'll just read it to you um, super quickly and then I'll unpack it. Be sure that if you kill the sort of man I say I am, you will not harm me more than yourself. Neither Miletus or Antius can harm me in any way. He could not harm me, for I do not think it's permitted that a better man be harmed by the worse. Certainly he might kill me, or perhaps banish or disenfranchise me, which he, and maybe others, think to be great harm, but I do not think so. I think he's doing himself much greater harm doing what he's doing now, attempting to have a man executed unjustly. Indeed, men of Athens, I'm far from making a defense now on my own behalf, as might be thought, but on yours to prevent you from wrongdoing and mistreating the gods gift to you by condemning me. For if you kill me, you will not easily find another like me. I was attached to this city by the god, though it seems a ridiculous thing to say, as upon a great, noble, um, a, a great and noble horse, which is somewhat sluggish, because of its side, and is needed to be stirred up by a kind of gadfly. It's to fulfill some such function that I believe the god has placed me in the city. I never cease to rouse each and every one of you to persuade you and reproach you all day long, and everywhere I find, I find myself in your company. Right? 
another such man will not easily come to be among you gentlemen and if you believe me you will spare me it might be uh, you might be easily annoyed with uh, with me as people are when they're aroused from a, a doze and strike out at me if convinced by Antaeus you could easily kill me and then you could sleep on for the rest of your days unless the god in his care uh, for you sent someone else I'm the kind of person uh, uh, to be a gift from the god to the city you might realize from the fact that it does not seem like human nature for me to have neglected all my own affairs and to have tolerated this neglect now for many years well I was always concerned uh, with you approaching each one of you like a father or an elder brother to persuade you to care for virtue now I if I profited from uh, this by charging a fee for my advice there would be some sense to it but you can see for yourselves that for all their shameless accusations my accusers have not been able in all of their impudence to or in, in, in impudence to bring uh, forward a witness to say that I've ever received a fee or ever asked for one I on the other hand have a convincing witness that I speak the truth my poverty first of all what is a gad fly it's a horse fly if you've ever been bit by a horse fly you know what it feels like right well the thing about the the workhorses in Athens is they would be sluggish because if you've ever been there it's hot it's hot right no horse that becomes sluggish and stops paying attention to what you wind up with carts in the ditch right so luckily nature has furnished this annoying little gnat to burrow into the backside of a horse and bite it it's painful but it shocks the horse to alertness and it can pay attention to what it's doing right now effectively what Socrates is saying is that Athens is a great noble horse but it's become sluggish right sluggish and happy to rest in its dogmatic slumber right of bare belief Socrates bites it on the ass by demanding reasons for that belief thus allowing the noble steed to pay attention and sufficiently discharge its responsibilities right to sufficiently perform its function right so effectively what Socrates is doing is demanding of the de democracy of Athens that it care for reasons care for arguments argue not based on opinion or belief or emotion but rather pay attention to reason right? care for justice care for virtue that sort of thing now effectively what Socrates is arguing here is something sort of interesting in order for a democracy to function in order for a state within which we both rule and are ruled a state in which we are to be persuaded by no force save for the unforced force of the better argument right effectively what we have to do is care for reasons and have those within society who demand reasons as justification for beliefs opinions and the assertions of the powerful so interestingly uh, the gadfly argument is often used as a justification for freedom of speech so effectively what we get is an argument for freedom of speech from Socrates here right I know you find what I am saying and how I approach you and demand reasons in the way of justification for your opinions your assertions your beliefs that sort of thing annoying but really if you want the democracy to be a democracy 
then what we need are people within the society with the courage of their convictions to argue demanding reasons right, in the way of justification so that each of us can vote when we vote based on those reasons rather than our own isolated dogmatic beliefs. Right. So right here is the first major argument for freedom of speech and by extension right, today freedom of the press. Right. A democracy cannot achieve its own ends without these protected freedoms. Right. So that's interesting that it winds up right here. Now effectively what Socrates is being prosecuted for right, is being annoying. Right? People don't like what he is arguing. People don't like how he's arguing. People don't like being put on the spot by Socrates. So effectively, they want to use the law to silence Socrates because what he argues is unpopular. So that's where we're at. Right? So um, effectively, right, um, there, there's one more small argument here, right, um, boo, 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 uh, where Socrates, uh, you know, addresses the, 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 the criticism, aren't you ashamed of yourself, right? aren't you ashamed for yourself through your occupation, what you've done is you've put your life in danger, right, isn't it what's best to actually preserve your own life, don't you have some sort of duty to do that, right, well Socrates gives a series of examples, Right, one where the thirty act, uh, thirty actually summoned him to a hall to uh, to bring in four others and have them executed. Right, Socrates instead went home. The rule of the thirty was short, and that's why Socrates wasn't executed there. Um, effectively, what Socrates is pointing out that you know really what we consider courage to be is not to fear death above all else, but rather to value justice above all else, right? So we shouldn't fear death above all else. In fact, what we should fear is acting unjustly. Why shouldn't we fear death? Well, he's going to point out later on. Do you know what death is? No, I've never done it. Right? We don't know what death is. So to fear death is to fear the unknown. And to fear the unknown is to claim we know something about it, namely that it's a bad thing. Right? So effectively to fear death is to think ourselves wise when in fact we are not. Now, if we're going to fear something, we should fear something we know to be bad, namely acting unjustly. So, this is a fairly strong sort of defense that Socrates has put in front of him. Um, and as I was mentioning uh, earlier, right, um, you know, effectively he's saying, it's, you know, it's, I've, I've, I've tried to have a conversation with you like we should in a democracy in the context of a court. I'm just going to speak the truth and you're going to judge the justice. I'm not going to play on the, your emotions because that would, you know, put both of us in a position where we're in the wrong, right? It, because you shouldn't. It's, it's actually a dereliction of your duties as jurors to give justice as a favor who's, uh, to, who seems good to you. You should be persuaded by reasons, and I should offer reasons. All right. Now, uh, page 39, the jury now gives the verdict of guilty, and Miletus asks for the death penalty. Now, um, Socrates starts off by pointing out that, whoa, that was close. Right? A switch of only 30 votes would have actually had... Um, uh, Miletus and Antius and Lycon and all of them um, paying a fee for wasting the court's time. But as it was, Socrates points out if he had more time to argue his position, perhaps he could have swayed those 30 people. Right? But as it is, so it is. Right? Now, 
Miletus suggests a penalty of death. Socrates now has to make a counter offer. And um, in fact, it, he's in sort of a weird position, right? Because he's being asked for an assessment of what he deserves for what he's done. He still doesn't think he's done anything wrong. So what does he think he deserves for what he has done? Free meals at the Britannium. The Britannium is um, it basically like a luxury rest home for um, the heroes at Olympia, right? the Olympics. Yeah, that's the Athenians too. Right? Um, you know, basically anyone who's won at the Olympics gets free meals for the rest of their life in this fancy rest home in Athens. They're just they just become wards of the state. They're well taken care of. Right? So um, effectively, that's what he floats. Because, um, as he says, nothing is more suitable, gen gentlemen, than for such a man to be fed in the Britannium. And much more uh, suitable for him than uh, for any one of you who's won a victory at Olympia with a pair or team of horses. The Olympian victor makes you think yourself happy. I make you happy. Besides, he does not need food, but I do. So if I must make a just assessment of what I deserve, I assess this free meals at the Britannium, but the Athenians think he's done something wrong, so it's got to be some sort of penalty, All right? So he mulls it over and thinks, um, well, what should I do, All right? I'm convinced that I never willingly wrong, or that I never w willingly wrong anyone, but I'm not convincing you of this, or we've talked together, but a short time. If it were the law with us, as it is elsewhere, that a trial for life should last not one but many days, you, sh you would be convinced. But now it's not easy to dispel great slanders in a short time. Since I'm convinced that uh, I wrong no one, I'm not likely to wrong myself, to say I deserve some evil and to make some such assessment against myself. What should I fear? that I should suffer the penalty uh, Miletus has assessed me, of which I say do not know whether it's good or bad. Am I then to choose in preference to this something I know very well to be an evil assess, uh, and assess uh, the penalty at that? Imprisonment? Why should I live in prison, always subjected to the ruling magistrates, the eleven? A fine and imprisonment until I pay it? Well, that would be the same thing for me as I have no money. Exile, for perhaps you would accept that assessment. Well, he's not going to assess that, right? Now, um, effectively, right, he's not going to assess that, right? Um, because, like, really, you know, he knows that to be a bad thing, right? Um, do, 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 do. I should um, have to be inordinately fond of life, men of Athens, to be so unreasonable as to suppose that other men will easily, easily tolerate my company and conversation. You, my fellow citizens, have been unable to endure them, but found them um, a burden and resented them so that you are now seeking to get rid of me. Far from it, gentlemen, it would um, be a, a fine life at my age to be driven from one city after another, for I know <clears throat> well uh, whether, uh, excuse, uh, wherever I go, the young men will listen to my talk as they do here. If, um, if I drive them away, they will themselves pr persuade their el elders to drive me out. If I do not drive them away, their fathers and relations will drive me out on their behalf. Perhaps someone might say, but Socrates, if you leave us, will you not be able to live quietly without talking? This is the most difficult point on which to convince some of you. If I say that it's impossible for me to keep quiet because that means disobeying the God, you will not believe me and think I'm being ironical. On the other hand, if I say that it's the greatest good for man to discuss virtue every day and those other things about which you hear me conversing and testing myself and others, for the unexamined life is not worth living for men, you will believe me even less. So 
effectively Socrates is between a rock and a hard place. If he suggests exile, then he's just going to go to another city-state and argue and converse as he does here. Right? And he's going to do that for those two reasons. One, because if he doesn't, he sees it as disobeying the god. Right? And two, really, it's the exercise of our most distinctive human capacities in a truly democratic kind of conversation. Right? So, effectively, what Socrates cannot do, the one thing he cannot do, is suggest exile. And we have the strong impression that, you know, nobody in Athens really wants to kill Socrates. They just want him to sit down, shut up, or go away. Right. So, effectively, right, what Socrates ultimately suggests as his penalty is a fine, and such a small fine, 30 minas of silver, that his buddies in the crowd, right, including Plato, who was there that day, um, it will, will actually loan him the money. Plato here, men of Athens, and Credo, and a few others, bid me uh, put the, the penalty at 30 minas, and they will stand as surety for the money. Well then, that's my assessment, and they will be sufficient guarantee of payment. Well, that didn't go well. Uh, jury votes, and sentences Socrates to death. And he gives a rather impassioned um, uh, goodbye Right. Um, a warning that there are others that he holds back because of their youth. He, they, they would be more vigorous, right, in their critiques of the Athenian city-state, right, than he. Right. He's holding them back now, but once he's dead, he won't be able to anymore. Um, uh, do, 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 do. Uh, further, his divine spiritual sign opposed him not at all while he was speaking. Right. And then finally, he reflects on what death is, and um, it, it basically, it's probably one of two things if we believe our cultural stories. One, it's like a long sleep with no dreams, doesn't sound bad, sounds peaceful. Or, um, it's the, um, the change in relocating of the soul from one place to another, to an afterlife. And if it's that afterlife kind of thing, oh boy, right? Uh, again, uh, who, uh, uh, 44, um, again, what would one of you give to keep company with Orpheus, uh, his odd Homer, etc.? All right. So effectively, what's Socrates going to do if it's that? Well, basically what he's going to do in that kind of company is with all the famous dead people, if they seem wise to him, he's going to question them. And if they do not seem wise to him, and then he's going to point it out, right? Now, um, his final statement, right? The one thing he asks Athenians for, this much I ask from them, when my sons grow up, avenge yourselves by causing them the same kind of grief I caused you. If you think they care for money or anything more than they care for virtue, or if they think they are somebody when they are nobody, reproach them as I reproach you, um, that they um, uh, do not care for the right things and uh, think they are worthy when they are not worthy of anything. If you do this, I shall have been justly treated by you and my sons also. Now the hour has come, um, come to, um, uh, to part has come. I go to die, you go to live. Which of us is, um, goes to the better lot is known to no one except for the God. Uh, so that was about the most unapologetic apology that you're ever going to come across. I know Socrates seems arrogant, right? calls himself the god's gift to the city, right? but nonetheless, to me it really seems like Socrates is being genuine here. Why am I doing these things? Because of my devotion to the gods. What was he accused of? Not believing in the gods. In fact, he is doing what he is doing, putting his life at risk. Because 
of his deep belief in the gods. Right? So effectively, right, what Socrates, I think, has done is offered an impassioned self-defense here. Right? Um, he bridged the gap between an epistemology in which he knows nothing and a positive ethics. We can actually require that people do things positively on the basis of ignorance. It's a really clever move. He's defined uh, the fundamental tenets of a democracy right? by driving a strong distinction between reason and emotions. We shouldn't emote. We should reason our way through these things. Right? Um, we're capable of self-rule because we all have this distinctive capacity to reason. Democracy is good because it depends on the exercise of this distinctive capacity. And within the context of democracy, we require gadflies. Right? We require people exercising freedom of speech in order to ensure that people have the reasons and the arguments they need to make an informed vote. Democracy cannot achieve its ends without these things, so this argument suggests protected freedoms, which Jefferson wrote into your founding documents in the States right, on the basis of this argument. So it's a really strong argument, I tend to think. Now, um, what we're going to get next from the Crito, um, yeah, I often say if the apology is about rights, and it seems to be, it seems to be about rights and the presuppositions of democracy. <coughs> the credo, on the other hand, is about responsibilities. Right? It's about responsibilities. And oddly, what we are going to get from Socrates is an argument that shows that if, when we follow reason, Sometimes the conclusions that we reach in terms of our duties or responsibilities are not pleasing to us, but nonetheless, we should still do what reason dictates that we should do. So on to the next, next video, and um, that's what's next.